afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. Thank you very, very much for joining us for this lecture in our Millennium Series. We are delighted that you've come. This afternoon's lecture is co-sponsored by UTEP's Office of Research and Sponsored Projects, the College of Engineering, and the Center for Environmental Resource Management. I'd like to thank Vice President Roberto Segueda, Dean Richard Schuphoister, and Dr. Barry Benedict for their support. The theme of this year's Millennium Lecture Series is contemporary issues. And our focus this month is on energy resources and sustainability. We've invited distinguished speakers to share with us their perspectives on this complex and increasingly pressing issue, which is certain to shape the future of our lives across the globe for generations to come. The first of those speakers is with us today, Dr. Dan Arbisu, Director of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, often referred to as NREL, in Colorado Springs. NREL is the U.S. Department of Energy's primary laboratory for energy efficiency and renewable energy research and development. During his long and distinguished career, Dan Arbisu served in executive management at Sandia National Laboratories, where he directed research centers for advanced energy technology, material and process sciences, and technology commercialization. Following his career at Sandia, he joined CH2M Hill Companies Limited as Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer. A graduate of New Mexico State University, Dr. Arvisu redeemed himself quickly by earning both his master's and doctoral degrees in mechanical engineering at Stanford University. I know that colleagues are here from New Mexico State. That was for you. That was all for you, okay? <laughs> Dan serves on a number of boards and advisory committees, including the American Council on Renewable Energy Advisory Board, the Energy Research Development and Deployment Policy Project Advisory Committee at the Harvard Kennedy School, of, uh, Harvard Kennedy School and the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Alternative Energies, and far too many others to go into here. In 2004, Dan was appointed to the National Science Board, the governing board of the National Science Foundation, and the National Science Policy Advisory Body to the President and the Congress, where I had the special pleasure of serving with him. A recipient of the Hispanic National Achievement Award for Executive Excellence, Dan Arvisu has been recognized by Hispanic Engineer Magazine as one of the top 50 most important Hispanics in business and technology. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to our distinguished colleague and our very good friend, Dan Arvisu. Thank you, Dr. Natalicio. It's always a pleasure to, to be here with you. I, I, um, I was just thinking as we were walking over here, <clears throat> uh, many of you know that I live in Colorado now, so uh, that's kind of what I consider home, although when I come back to this region of the country and, uh, and I get a warm welcome in New Mexico, uh, last time I testified in front of Congress, Senator Bingaman uh, mentioned that they claim, they still claim me as, as a New Mexican in, in, uh, in, um, uh, in New Mexico. And then also, I was born in Arizona, and judging from the, wel from the welcome that I get when I come to Texas, I guess you could say I'm wanted in four states. <laughs> so uh, the good news is uh, it's always great to be in this region of the country and uh, certainly to get uh, some good uh, Mexican food and some home cooking, which I, which I get a chance to do. Um, what I wanted to do uh, this afternoon, and I, it's been three and a half years since I was here last and, and uh, gave a, a, a presentation on kind of the state of affairs of, um, of technology as it relates to, to renewable energy and, and a sustainable energy future. And I, I titled my talk a little bit of an aspirational talk, meaning uh, I knew it would be, we would be at the... At, at, at a point we could call success when we didn't refer to renewable energy as alternative energy. 
when alternative energy is actually mainstream energy, then I know we've kind of achieved the end goal. I'm going to talk about end goals today, and I really want to get an opportunity to, uh, to maybe bring a message that's a little bit different than what you've heard. If not, uh, then, then you're ahead of the game. Uh, I'll always start with, again, you know, what are our objectives? The objectives have to do with security, they have to do with economy, they have to do with environment. You can't solve the problem unless you do all three of them simultaneously. And so we start thinking much more long term, much more holistically. Um, as uh, Dr. Natalicio mentioned, uh, I had the privilege to serve on the National Science Board with her uh, uh, for, for several years. Um, and one of, the, one of the products of that board uh, in recent times is this report called the Building Sustainable Energy Futures. It's a, it's a task force that was co-chaired by myself and, and Dr. John Strauss. Uh, and uh, we provided some counsel to the new administration and uh, to the Congress on what does it take to get to a long-term sustainable energy economy. And the, and, the, and the six elements that you see here on this chart were things we spoke to. This is a very challenging issue. It's a very, very challenging uh, problem with lots of complexities. But it has everything to do with a variety of things that educational institutions are a part of, as well as uh, national laboratories. We need, a, we need a strategy, a, a, a real strategy. We need to boost R&D investment. We need policies. Uh, we need a, a, an educated workforce. We need a workforce of the future. Uh, we need to be part of the global engagement and dialogue. And probably as important as anything on that list is we need to promote public awareness because I think there's a lot of misinformation and certainly misunderstanding about what's necessary and how we might get there. So I draw you to that attention. So let me just start real quick by setting some context and then I'll get to talk a little bit about technology status. Uh, from the start, I'll say that this is our energy system. Uh, there's a lot of numbers on this chart, I won't go through them, but there's a supply piece, there's an end-use piece, and there's everything in the middle that connects both fuels and electricity. The most important number on this chart is this one down here. It's the inefficiency that we have in today's energy system. We waste literally two-thirds of the energy before it gets to the point where we're actually using it for the purpose that we really care about in terms of, in terms of, a, of a service that it provides. Uh, a little bit more context setting. This is our energy production. The top chart is the production. The, the bottom one is consumption. And it, and it uh, kind of highlights the amount of renewable energy we have. 6% uh, non-hydro renewables is part of our energy production. The difference between production and consumption is that we import a lot of oil. That's the, that's the main difference between these two charts. Uh, so on that basis, 6% uh, or 5%, depending on how you count, it's a small fraction, and the projections are that it kind of stays small for a long time. The next chart is electricity generation. Same sort of, same sort of uh, outcome. This is, this is nameplate generation. Many of you will know that, that the, that the um, generation capacity of the country is more than the actual generation capacity, primarily, I'm sorry, the, 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 the total capacity is more than the generation, primarily because we have a lot of what we call spending reserves or extra energy, and it's roughly 50%. We have a little bit more than 50% of our capital stock kind of in use at any one point, any one point in time. So in other words, it's, that's the average. Uh, so on that basis, renewables uh, is something on the order of, of, of 3%, or uh, 4% rather, or 3% if it's just on the, on the number of kilowatt hours generated because there's a capacity factor in some of these technologies. What's interesting to most people is that uh, biomass is still the leader, both on the on the on the consumption side and on the uh, and on the electricity side, and and uh, and wind and solar are, are the two ones we hear about a lot. They're starting to come up, but they're still relatively small in terms of overall contributions. Okay, well, what's new? Since the last time I was here, one of the things that uh, that I'm perhaps uh, uh, maybe refreshed by is that, that we're having a national dialogue that's based on that set of of, uh, of objectives that I believe the National Science Board was was uh, quick to point out were necessary in order to get to a sustainable energy economy. The president talked about in 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 uh, certainly in on the campaign and then after uh, taking office uh, a big boost in. Uh, R&D, essentially, in, in, in alternative energy over the course of the next 10 years. That's 10 times, by the way, what we, what we had previously been doing on an annual basis. A lot of things, a lot of stats on this chart. The one that I'll point out is this one down here. Probably the most profound difference in the way in which we're doing things uh, in the future than we've been doing them in the past. This happens to be the G20 meeting in, in, uh, in Italy, where the U.S. signed up 
with the other G8, uh, G, I'm sorry, G20 countries to uh, a, a, um, uh, a commitment that we would try to hold the global warming to less than two degrees C above pre-industrial levels. What that means is that the uh, emission uh, or, the, or the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere would be below uh, 450 parts per million. And what that translates to is 80% reduction of CO2 emissions from our, from our mix by the year 2050. Right. That is an absolutely daunting task. I can tell you right now there's no technical pathway that gets you to those kind of numbers that we're aware of. The good news is that that is a goal that is, is, very, uh, is, is uh, more than stretch. It's very aspirational. And in fact, it begins to think, it begins to demand that we think differently about our energy uh, future. Um, so I make the point that profound transformation is required. This is the attributes of our system today. These are the attributes that we really care about. If we had a sustainable energy system, this is what it would look like. We should really be technology agnostic. We really shouldn't care how we get there if we can, in fact, do this. What that means is we define this end state very differently than we have in the past. We need to reduce technology risk. Innovation will be the key to achieving this, but it'll be done only with an understanding of what the end point and the objective is. Well, what that means is we really shouldn't be thinking about energy for energy's sake. We should be thinking about the services that it provides. And what it provides is mobility and access on the transport side. And it provides essentially comfort, heat and power on the, on the uh, electricity side. So there's, a, there's an electricity piece of this. There's a transport system. But if you really think about it, <clears throat> there's really, it's a system of systems. It's a, it's a much broader context. And the way we like to look at it and the way we're trying to, to look at it is on the electricity side, there's the as-built environment. There's the, there's the generation of electricity. On the transport side, there's the transport sector, and then there's the fuel piece that goes with that. And if you start thinking about that, these systems are actually overlapping one another. At some point, we will electrify the transport sector. And when we do those, we begin to mesh. Ultimately, what we want is this piece in the middle, which is, which is essentially a sustainable you know, community, both industrial and, 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 and business and residential. So this is what we're after. These systems will lead us there. But we need to think holistically about that problem because if we don't, we will under-optimize the system. And this is really the new thinking that you're going to see certainly coming out of, uh, out of our laboratory and, and hopefully out of the Department of Energy as we go forward. There's a short-term piece. There's a, there's a, there's a longer-term piece. And then, of course, there's the longest piece because, as I mentioned before, we don't know what pathways will actually get us to those endpoints in 2050. And, and there's a big gap. And so we're going to need us to fill the pipeline. Now, the good news is that we've been investing uh, you know, for several decades in, in uh, the alternative energy space, the energy efficiency space. And so there, with this newfound interest in moving more rapidly in this arena, there's actually harvesting of some past investments. And we can actually do that. The, the economic stimulus package that was passed in the US, $37 billion applied to clean energy. Was a, was a pretty good down payment on starting to move technology in the marketplace that actually had relevance today. I might add, China had $38 billion in clean energy investment. And theirs is actually much more focused than ours. So th we're not unique in this, and, th and there's a lot of effort going on. Well, so there's tools and things we can do to move technology more rapidly today into the marketplace, and there's a variety of things that make sense today. Longer term, one of the things that we have to be thinking about is in the next few years, we really need to be aggressively pushing the agenda. And this is kind of next generation technology. One of the, one of the difficulties that we have with first generation technology is, is that most of it has moved offshore. When, you, when, when, uh, when we ask, you know, well, how big is the industry? It's about a $150 billion industry. 10% of that is in the US. Most of it is in Europe and in Asia. And it's all based on first generation technology, much of which was developed in the US but now has been adopted by foreign companies and, and based on the fact that there are huge public policies in Europe and in Asia. And that's where the markets are. And these companies move to where the markets are. So what you have is really first generation technology manufacturing is already occurring elsewhere. We're not going to catch up. We're not going to catch up because right now China has six of the top ten photovoltaic manufacturing 
um, uh, companies in the world. And, and, and that has happened in the last three years. What we, what we can do is next generation technology. Next generation technology is that stuff that's going to be disruptive and come online in the next maybe five to ten years. And there is, in fact, a lot of opportunity for us to move to things like thin film technologies for photovoltaics instead of the crystalline silicon technologies, which is first generation technology. And I think what our role in the government in the laboratory system is, is reducing the risk for, for the private sector to make investments and to move these markets much more quickly. So that's kind of what we're doing in the, in the midterm. In the longest term, what we really need to do is really fill the pipeline with some revolutionary types of technologies. You know, you hear a lot about nanoscale uh, material uh, processes and whatnot. There's tremendous capabilities, and I think uh, uh, new innovation that's occurring at the laboratory level that's quite phenomenal. And I'll, uh, I'll mention those a couple of those as we go forward. We need to get the policy framework right. When I was here three and a half years ago, this map, I showed a map like this, was only 20 states. This is closer to 30 states. They're all part of having some motivation, some regional economic development driver for moving technology into the marketplace, clean technology. We still don't have federal policy. There's actually a discussion going on in the legislature and in, and in, the, uh, and in the halls of the Congress right now for a new energy um, approach, and, and uh, whether it's cap and trade or some other, some other um, uh, mechanism, uh, I, I do believe there'll be energy legislation at the federal level. Right now, we don't have that. It's all happening at the state level. Um, I frequently get asked um, about resource potential. So I, I, uh, the laboratory created this thing. We do a lot of resource assessment. Uh, this this uh, set of graphics are Ind indicative, I believe, of the opportunity space. This happens to be solar energy, if, if you were to try to capture it with, with, uh, with, uh, with photovoltaics or, or flat panels or whatever um, across the country. If we add in concentrating solar power, where you're looking at the direct part of the sunlight and you concentrate it and, and uh, provide um, energy that way, you get you know, a, a large uh, resource uh, concentration here in the southwest. If you add to that wind, what you find is you got the upper Midwest, you got offshore, beginning to see this, this, uh, uh, the, 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 the country fill out in terms of opportunity. If you add biomass, you get, again, a population. Uh, there, now the southeast is beginning to participate in some way. If you add geothermal, you get additional, uh, additional resources. And if you add run of river hydropower kinds of things, you get even more. Okay? The rationale or the reason for showing this, this kind of a graphic is to demonstrate that we are a country rich in renewable energy resources. And there is a tremendous op set of opportunities here, and it's not just located in any one place. Everybody has something, is kind of the point. I've overlaid on top of this the grid, the transmission electricity grid of the country. And for the most part, we can access a lot of that renewable energy. There are some up here in the, middle, in the Midwest that we, can, we need some transmission, and some down here in the Southwest where we need some transmission to really capture what, we, what uh, is available to us. If you just look at theoretical potential, it is an enormous amount of energy. I, I, I frequently give the talk and I talk about questions that, 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 that Congress asked me. They asked me two questions. One, when is this technology going to be real? And the second one was how much we can get. Well, when, I, when they ask me the how much we can get part, I give them this, these numbers and I say, it's, it's how much do you want? It's not a matter of how much you can get. It's a matter of your will, commitment, and investment to make whatever future you want happen. It is a matter of how much do you want. And, the, and there is no limit on how much we can get. These numbers are enormous relative to the needs of the country. And so the, the, the opportunity for us is to harness what is there so that we can actually begin to be about the business of implementation. And, and uh, there's a lot of things that need to be done. Um, let me just do a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, um, uh, of a status report on some of the technologies and where they're going. Energy efficiency, the lowest hanging fruit, whether I, remember, I mentioned uh, being technology agnostic, the one thing you start with is let's be much more efficient about how we use energy. So buildings is kind of the as-built environment. It's a huge driver for our, in our, for our consumption. These numbers over here are fairly phenomenal. 40% of primary energy, 70% of our electricity is used in buildings. Okay, uh, the goals that we have now are are fairly, um, I think, challenging but doable. And that is, we're talking about 
starting a, a program for that by the year 2025, we can have net zero energy buildings, meaning buildings that on an annual basis will generate as much energy as they consume. Now that seems pretty, I mean, considering these numbers, you think, well, that's pretty challenging. Actually, it can be done. Um, wh where do buildings use energy? Well, so 40%, again, of our, of our um, energy consumption is buildings. Part of it's residential, part of it's commercial. Look at these numbers. Lights, heating, and cooling, over 50% of the energy consumption for, re for commercial. For, for residential, it's heating, um, cooling, and lights as well, all, almost 50%. There's a tremendous amount of energy used in these various components of, of building stock. Well, what can you do? Well, there's a lot of things you can do. And, and uh, you know, we demonstrated on a Habitat for, hum for Humanity home that you could do net zero energy at the cost of a habit Habitat for Humanity home. They have certain production costs. You know, these are not, these are not really extravagant homes. These are homes for people that, that, are, uh, that are challenged economically. And, and we've demonstrated you can actually do this at a cost that, that's commensurate with Habitat for Humanity. There's all kinds of technologies that one can apply. Electrochromic windows that, that uh, you send them an electrical signal and the, and the window darkens when you don't want the sun to come through. It lightens when you do want the sun to come through. And this is very, very, uh, very uh, sophisticated but, but very elegant technology. Uh, optimization, um, desiccant cooling and evaporative cooling for places like like El Paso, where you have tremendous uh, um, heat, uh, air conditioning needs, but you can do them uh, in a low-cost way. And well, I want to—I've I've been in, uh, in meetings all day and, and talked to a number of different folks, and I, I think I bragged on, my, on, on this building uh, in, in every session that I've had today. This is our new research support facility, and really, it's—it's it's it's our personnel building. It's where our researchers are going to go. In two months, we'll move into this building, and this building will be net zero energy. Uh, we've, we've done a variety of things in this building to demonstrate precisely the concepts that I mentioned to you. And I figured if we at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory can't demonstrate and live in facilities that we advocate that others do, that we shouldn't be in the business that we're in. We need to show the way. And this building will do that. When we add the third wing over here next year, it'll hold 1,200 people and it'll be net zero energy. And the idea here is to demonstrate all the technologies that are, that are part of it. And we did it at a cost equal to or less than a building built to code. It does not have to cost extra is the point. And so there are things that you can do and there, you, know, you have to tailor them, but we did a lot of things in this building that are not conventional. And, and, and uh, it'll be uh, an interesting experiment. So I invite you to take a look at progress on that one. Okay, renewable energy supply. This is on the supply side, so the generation side. So wind uh, is, is, is uh, when I talk about wind uh, three and a half years ago, the total number of megawatts installed in the country was 10,000. We installed 10,000 megawatts last year alone. We now have 35,000 in the country and close to 100,000 in in, around the world. Uh, lots of progress on these technologies. Costs haven't come down as much as I would have anticipated. But uh, it's a moving target. Lots of things are changing. Um, tremendous new opportunities. Offshore wind is another big technology thing. There's, there's a lot of opportunity space in, the, in, in both uh, technology improvements and, and in technology application deployment, things like wind forecasting. We, if we were better at forecasting wind, we could really reduce the cost or improve the, the performance of, of wind farms going forward. Um, I'm a little nervous about reliability on some of these turbines. Uh, you know, three quarters of the, of the capital stock that's out there has been put into play in the last five years. We really don't have 20 year experience with most of these turbines. So there's a lot of things I, I think yet to, yet to be concluded, but important nonetheless. Um, solar. I, I'm, I'm on the uh, Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC Special Report on Renewable Energy. We're looking at what is the mitigation potential opportunity for renewable energy uh, to help with global warming. And, um, so I, and I'm the coordinating lead author on the solar chapter, so I'm, this is particularly uh, of interest to me. And, and what, what I want to, uh, uh, I say that to say this, and that is there is a piece of solar thermal which includes hot water, Building, building passive and, and daylighting and things of that nature that are no-brainer kind of technologies. Those are technologies that are essentially cost-effective today. China uses hot water heaters uh, from solar. Uh, the Middle East uses hot water heaters from solar. And how many hot water heaters do you think we have in the U.S.? Almost none. 
absolutely astounding that there isn't a use of a technology that makes absolute sense and we just simply don't have it. So there's, there's, there's more to this than just the technology. Now I'm going to talk about these two because this is where the national program is focused. As a, as a practical matter, this is, where, this is where deployment should be focused. But uh, there is, in fact, a lot of, a lot of interest, I think, uh, to, to try to change that paradigm. So let me talk about photovoltaics. When I was here last, this number was about 40% um, of what these numbers are now. And again, driven by a lot of things that relate to public policy. Um, concentrating solar power hasn't yet begun to take off, but the orders and the new, and the new opportunities for it are, in fact, uh, very, very large. And this number could be very, very uh, large in the next uh, several years. Uh, a lot of research going on. There's some uh, really elegant things going on in the laboratory. And as I mentioned, first generation technology has pretty much gone offshore. What we're looking at now is nanostructured materials and, and low cost ways of doing thin film roll to roll processing so that we can move very quickly in terms of scale up and manufacturing. Um, there is a whole suite of technologies that are yet in the, in, the, in the marketplace. And these are spawning a lot of new startups. Uh, venture capital money is flowing. The most venture capital investments in this country in, in, the, in the green energy space is in solar. And it's because there is great potential. As I showed you before, the potential for renewable energy is going to be dominated by solar. Solar will have more uh, contribution mid-century than all the other technologies combined. Not that the others are not important. Just there's such a huge resource. And we just need to, solar technologies are a little bit farther, be, farther behind in terms of the solar to electricity conversion, but not on the thermal side. So here are a suite of, of, of capabilities that I think we'll, we'll begin to uh, exploit. Uh, geothermal is another one that where we, we've really neglected the technology for a lot of years. There's a lot of opportunity space. If you go to Europe, Northern Europe in particular, they do a lot of these ground coupled geothermal heat pumps, they call them. Um, and we don't do much of that here, and we should. It's, it's, again, it's low-hanging fruit. There's also a new uh, generation of uh, geothermal that's called enhanced geothermal. It's, it's really very deep drilling and then reservoir management to extract um, the, the, the thermal energy that's in the core of the earth. And um, tremendous opportunity here in terms of the number of, of opportunity, the, um, the amount of resources available, and it's pretty much uni uniform across the country. Uh, we're, we're doing a variety of things to begin to, to kickstart that. We're just now looking at it again for the first time since you know the, the mid 80s uh, when we had uh, fairly robust uh, geothermal programs. Um, biomass. I'll say a word about biomass because it, it surprises folks how much how much biomass electricity production we have. It's mostly off grid. It's mostly not on grid, um, and it's because we have pulp and paper and, and some of these other. Um, uh, types of, uh, of sectors of the, of the, of, of the industry that, that need thermal uh, and, and, and uh, they have access to different kinds of geothermal. And, and there's a lot of co-firing that's going on more and more these days with coal. So it, it's, a, it's an area that we need to explore and, and, and continue to exploit. Uh, biofuels is another area where there's a tremendous new investment and certainly, uh, I think, new attention. You know, we, we started off um, in, in a few years ago uh, with, with, with biofuels primarily focused on ethanol. And, and so the national program was focused on corn ethanol, and, and you know, quite honestly and frankly, I, I, I say it frequently, uh, that was driven mostly by ag policy, not by energy policy. Uh, helping corn farmers in the Midwest is, is, is politically very, uh, very popular, and uh, it's not a bad thing, it's just not energy policy. So we, we, we've been able to springboard from that and now looking at biofuels in a much different way. And now we're looking at biofuels that get you from carbohydrates to hydrocarbons in a way that utilizes the infrastructure that we've already invested in. And so there's a lot of attention to that going forward. And I think that really is where most of our attention will go in the near future. But our costs even for ethanol are coming down. And so, you know, at $2.22 uh, a gallon, of gasoline equivalent, um, these are becoming quite quite uh, important new opportunities uh, in the context of of rising oil oil prices. So there's a lot of there's a lot of, of interest, and I think a lot of technology that's now being applied. The government has actually uh, put in about four billion dollars, including the stimulus money, uh, over the past uh, three years in biofuel. Uh, applications. So you're, you're going to see a lot more important things and again as I mentioned it's really more beyond ethanol than anything we've done before and there's a big push even right now and I know we, I talked to some of the, some of the faculty today about, uh, about capabilities here 
in, at uh, UTEP regarding algae. I mean, there, there is, in fact, another big push, I think, to start beginning to exploit some of these pathways that uh, have con been considered longer term for a long time. Well, uh, one of the things that I, is important uh, to me, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, if we start setting a new vision, is that we really need to understand what problem are we solving. And you can't really do that without what I call strategic energy analysis. So we have, have, have put a concerted effort at our laboratory to think about how to excuse me, how to define that problem a lot more rigorously. And so we, we, we've got a, a whole uh, a new core of, of analysts uh, and partnering with universities to help us look at life cycle impacts of some of these, if you were to take a technology and, and, and use it globally, where, where the emerging economies uh, would perhaps uh, use it more, uh, more uh, uh, you, uh, uh, ubiquitous than we would, in that case, what would, be the, what would be the implications of that? What does it do in terms of land use, uh, uh, water use, in terms of, in terms of uh, carbon displacement and, and, and other social interests that we might have? And we've done a lot of analysis on that, and we're now looking very carefully at how do you move technology more rapidly in the marketplace, and then what are the implications of that? So lots of, lots of work in, in the strategic energy analysis. None of this will happen without a much smarter utility grid in the, on the electricity side. The, the, there's the, the idea of a distributed resource uh, can only be enabled if you have a grid that can accommodate variable generation and variable supply simultaneously. Now I believe this will happen. It, it is in fact the ripest opportunity for high level sophisticated jobs that look like IT industry. There is tremendous new efforts I think going on along this entire pathway and, but it will all be enabled by a new energy grid. The, uh, in the strategic energy analysis slide, in the previous uh, slide, one of the things that we've done is we've looked at the, the, the eastern wind interconnect, gr grid interconnect, and, and, and tried to figure out how do you put a lot more renewable resources on it. And the one thing it, it, it tells you is you need a lot more transmission. But you don't just need any transmission. You need smart transmission. You need transmission that can accommodate variable inputs, both on the demand side and on the supply side. And so there's a big effort now. We've largely ignored this, this sector. It's, it's heavily regulated, which makes it unattractive for market investment. And so we've got to get the policy right on this. Without that, we don't enable, I think, a lot of, a lot of effort that, that could very well be, uh, be important. As a, as a consequence of understanding that, one of the next facilities that we're building at the National Renewable Energy Lab is this one, the Energy Systems Integration Facility. And it's a place where the utilities can come and look at what are the implications of high penetration distributed resources on the electricity grid before they run the experiment of actually putting it on the grid and having something bad happen that they don't want to happen. This is the opportunity that they have to partner with the national programs to understand what are the implications of high penetration renewables on the grids. And so this building has been essentially already appropriated. It's a $130 million building. And it, in fact, will provide new capabilities that we've never had before at the megawatt scale to look at what are the implications of renewable energy. These are the kinds of things that we have to be doing in order to move the ball forward on some of the technologies that we're talking about before. And then I don't want, I want to kind of, kind of end with the, with, the, with the last piece of this thing, which really has a lot to do with innovation. Innovation is really the key. And innovation won't occur if we don't have a trained workforce. It won't occur if we haven't invested in our universities and our, and our R&D facilities around the, around the country. And it really won't occur if we don't have the vision that says we actually care about the endpoint that we, we talked about before. We, we really do need to recognize that it's scientists and engineers and the, and the, and the, and the, and the technically literate public that will make this happen. And there, what I can tell you is after having been in this business almost 35 years now, that the innovation that we saw in the laboratory in the late 70s and early 80s is now today's commercial product. And I was very excited about what we were doing back then. I can tell you today in the, in the research laboratories, not just at NREL, but everywhere I go, all the national labs in the U.S. and even international labs across the world, there's, there's absolutely phenomenal innovation. I believe we can get the innovation right. We've got to get the policy right and the public awareness that says we want to do this. If we do, I think we've got a fighting chance at solving the, ma the major problems, but it really has to do with, with scientists and engineers going forward. It's about mobilizing capital. So the, the technology is important, the policy is important, the markets are important. It will be driven by the private sector. Innovation is driven by investment. 
And unless we get the policies right to allow the investment to take place, the innovation won't occur. So there's a, there's a very complicated symbiosis that must occur in order for this all to happen. So, it, so from our perspective at the laboratory, we're looking at the financial community, we're looking at the, at the, at the at policy community, and we're looking again at the R&D community. All of those are important, I think, uh, to move ahead. So it's transformational change. I think we've got we've to start on it. We're beginning to understand the problem. Uh, we've got a long ways to go. But I remain the eternal optimist. I think there is a way to do this. And I think it can be done basically with the, the workforce that we're now currently training. Uh, it's going to be a long campaign, and it's going to take decades, not one political cycle or two. It'll take a long, long time. And I think ultimately we'll get there. Uh, at our laboratory, uh, this is our 10-year plan. It's a, it's a couple of billion dollar build out. Uh, we're, you know, we're, we're not bashful about now making, uh, making some projections about what we, uh, what we think is necessary and how we can, how we can participate. Um, it's an exciting time for us to be in this, in this, in this arena. Uh, the problems are challenging. I think we cannot uh, uh, delay in, in moving forward. Um, and we uh, believe it's a partnership between all of the R&D communities around the country and for that matter, around the world. Thank you. Okay, so now it's your turn. We have time for some questions and uh, comments. So please, if you have one to offer, step up to the microphone so that we can hear you clearly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, although uh, your field is renewable energy, uh, I just wanted to run a couple of ideas up the flagpole to see if maybe you knew uh, something that we don't about this uh, now. Uh, Carbon sequestration is, is part of the program against global warming, but if we, instead of just looking at this, uh, these millions of tons of carbon dioxide from, say, coal burning that we have to dispose of somehow, uh, is there any thought been given to using them where they can be useful, like in declining oil fields? If you put the coal gen uh, electrical generated plant there, so that you'll have the uh, CO2 and just pump it down to the ground where it will help pump, uh, pump up the oil that's already down there. Also, another idea, we've been spotlighted, been spotlighted by the recent accident there. Now, uh, do you think there's room for, for a continuum to, uh, to, have, uh, to have one of the ground coal mines without having so many people to have to be actually down here for the least use of industrial robotics or, and remote control that's had been advances in other countries that you know about. Thank you. Okay, well, I, I appreciate your question. Thank you, thank you for uh, um, uh, recognizing that there are multiple pathways. Uh, there's another laboratory that is, that's focused on fossil fuels. That's the National Energy Technology Laboratory in, in uh, Pittsburgh and in uh, Morgantown, uh, West Virginia. Um, what, uh, and, and I'm forming a partnership with them because I think uh, all of the various pathways need to be communicating with one another. So whether you're talking about nuclear, whether you're talking about fossil fuels with carbon capture and sequestration, um, I think we all need to put, be putting our heads together. The Undersecretary for Energy has all of these various programs and all these laboratories reporting into her. This is Dr. Christina Johnson. And she's asked us as the technologists and, and the, and the R&D providers uh, to provide an integrated plan. And we're working at trying to do that. It's a, it's a difficult task. Um, without speaking specifically to what the pathways might be for carbon capture and sequestration, uh, I can say this. We need to do a lot more work to understand uh, how you can capture carbon out of fossil fuel streams uh, efficiently and at an affordable cost. And then we also need to think very, very carefully about how do we sequester that carbon or use the carbon in some other, in some other uh, use that might be beneficial as well. Uh, there's a lot of structural changes that need to take place in all of the in incumbent industries. And, um, and so there's, there's no, there's no uh, fewer, there's, there, there's, there's no um, lack of challenges in, uh, in fossil fuels. Um, if, in fact, they can capture carbon and they can sequester it and it can be done safely and it can, and it can meet the attributes that I gave on that, on that transformational slide, then I think that ought to be included. Um, 
it's a challenge. It's a challenge for all of us. I think we all ought to be held accountable to the same set of metrics about what we're trying to, trying to kind of accomplish. And, and if safety is an issue, both on the nuclear side and on the, on the, on the coal mining side, then let's address that. Uh, I think our, we should demand of our energy system that it have those attributes that I mentioned on those other earlier slides. And there's going to be a transition period. That's important. Um, but we should not lose sight of what objective we want and, and then hold ourselves accountable to those. So that's uh, my, my response to, I think there's a place for all those technologies. Thank you very much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Dr. Isu. First, I want to thank you for being here today in El, in El Paso on this beautiful sunny day. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're thank the you. apex of the, of the solar energy. Uh, what I'd like for you to do is draw upon your fantastic accomplishments and your background and knowledge, and we're the head of a career guidance counselor. And you're speaking to a high school young man, young woman, or maybe a young man or young woman that is just now coming out of the military after serving this great country. Where would you advise them that the jobs are going to be in this wonderful industry? And, and I ask you to please focus on the two-year degrees as well as the four-year degrees that our young people can enter into this job market and have a great future. Um, well, good. That's that's a that's a question that I haven't had before. So that's that's that'll <laughs> challenge me. Um, <laughs> Great. Well, I, I do get a chance to, 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 uh, to, to um, uh, provide at least some level of input to uh, the uh, decision space that, that students are, are engaging in. Um, I, would, I would say the, that there, there is tremendous opportunity in what I would call the green energy space. Um, I think what we've recognized now is that it's not so much discipline focused as it is interdisciplinary. Uh, I would advise students, whether they be in vocational schools or, or, in, or in more uh, technically rigorous schools, um, that you need to have a broad understanding of marketplace applications. Uh, you, you, you need to be paying attention to where are the market niches. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not as confident that we're going to get to the end point that I would like to see uh, in a straight path. It's going to be a meandering path. And what we need is creativity, and we need innovation, we need entrepreneurs, we need people who understand business as well as technology, and that they, and they can move the technology from the grassroots effort up. Because it's, you know, we almost have to shame the federal government into making the right kind of decisions regarding policy. Policy is, you know, with one policy stroke, like building codes, you could change a lot of things. We tend not to do that. We tend to wait until there's a human cry that, you know, that we've got some opportunity that we're missing because, uh, because of public policy still getting in the way. So it's, it's, I think it's not so much a faith, uh, I think, uh, decision to, to move into, into green, to the green energy space. I think that, that being very uh, science and technology literate is an important ingredient to being, um, uh, a, um, to being able to take advantage of what I believe is an inevitable movement. Uh, it is grassroots at this point. Uh, again, the Europeans and the, and the Asians are moving more quickly than us, but the next big market is the U.S. The U.S. has got the, the largest uh, energy market in the future. So I, I think it, it, is, it is get trained. Um, I, I think there, if, you, if you start with, with markets, that will adopt certain technologies. There'll be a value chain that goes with those. And, th and then there will be opportunities for all of the people in the value chain, like installers of, of, of equipment and that, that understand the marketplace, uh, to, uh, to also contribute and to be participants in it. So, you know, the, the kind of the early, the, the, the early advice is get trained in a, in a broad set of skills and, and then really understand the business value propositions because that's where most of the jobs will be created. We all know that small businesses are kind of where technology uh, tends, to, tends to reside first. Small get businesses get gobbled up by big businesses. And, um, and I think uh, when, when, when small businesses show a value proposition, then it's really a rewarding career path for, for students. So I think, you know, depending on what student is oriented toward research or toward those are things, there, there's a broad set of skills that are required independent of all of those various other orientations and, and hopefully that'll help, uh, I think, move them forward. Once again, thank you for being here. You're welcome. Okay. 
Uh, Texas has a number of wind farms. I was wondering what you felt the reason why T. Boone Pickens switched from wind farms to natural gas. <coughs> Well, so so T, T Boone is is a is a really um, uh, financially savvy individual, as his his track record would uh, would manifest. Um, he he started in the wind farms primarily because he saw a void, and the void was there's no transmission, and until you have transmission, you can't sell wind turbines because you got to move essentially the energy from where the resource is to where the load is. So in his case, the, his, his business value proposition was, I can write a check, I'll just build the transmission. And he did that. So he built transmission through the renewable energy zones in Texas. And now Texas has the, the greatest amount of wind um, turbine uh, capacity of any, of any state in the union, including, I mean, they just passed California last year. And that's what got him into the wind business. He took one step further and said, what does the country really need? Uh, the, the country really needs to move out of their dependence on imported oil. He, that's, his, that's, an, a major, that's a major piece of his. And, and um, when he met with, with President Bush, I, 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 from someone who was in the room, I got the, I got the story. You know, he wrote the number like you know, 200 billion on, on the board in the White House, in the Oval Office, and said, that's how much money we're sending overseas every year because we're, we're dependent on, on foreign oil. I'm not sure what the number was now, but it was a big number. Uh, his his, his uh, conclusion was that we don't have an alternative for liquid transportation fuel. You know, biofuels is a good start, but it doesn't take the place of the appetite we have for liquid transportation fuels. Well, taking a page from what the Brazilians have already done is why don't we use our natural gas not to generate electricity, which is what we're doing, we're using it for peaking capacity. The last 10 years has been nothing but natural gas for electricity. Instead of making electricity with natural gas, why don't we make transportation fuel with natural gas and use our wind turbines to make electricity? I mean, it makes good sense. Now, there are a whole bunch of reasons why you can't do that. <laughs> but it makes, it's, it's logical. And, and, uh, and so I, I think part of, part of his motivation was Okay, so now I, I got in early in this market. The, you know, the, the economy went south. Now I don't have a market for my wind turbines. I need them to, to sell something. I'm going to go propose this thing. So there's a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a perhaps parochial bias in there. But it is a good idea. Uh, the concept of moving us towards something different in transportation is, I think, very sound. It's just going to be structurally hard to do because essentially you need to now transport natural gas like you transport gasoline. I think more likely what we'll do is we will electrify the transport sector. I think we'll go to, and, and, and we start with, with, with hybrids and then plug-in hybrids and then ultimately electric cars. We, we do need, we need improvements in batteries. In order to do that, we really need improvements in batteries. We're just simply not there. It will never be cost effective to the, to the, tax, to the consumer, to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the general public, until we bring the cost of batteries down. And, and that's, a, that's a research effort. We've simply got to do that. But his idea is a good one. If you needed to do something quick, if, you, if it was a matter of national security, you could do what T. Boone is, at, is, is suggesting, and it would be a solution. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be free. It would cost something, but we could do it. So there's merit to the discussion. I think he's added a lot to the national dialogue. Um, don't think it'll happen, but I think uh, the idea and the motivations are all, are all sound. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. So I appeal. You mentioned at the beginning that nuclear power supplied 11.5 percent of energy. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't mentioned after that in the. And I just wanted to ask about that since uh, it is such a big issue in certain circles. You know about the uh, plural, plural carbon gas uh, that's emitted in the uh, emission process, and about depleted uranium. I looked at the. Department of Energy uh, website about a month or two ago, and they, you know, they mentioned that they sell the depleted uranium at uh, once the defense needs of the United States military are taken care of. They're referring to the, uh, the tanks, to the new weapons mm -hmm. that uh, are used with depleted uranium. Of course, that's a very big issue, too, because of the uh, right. harm done to both Iraqis, Afghans, and Americans. We used the man here in 
in the in the Mex in, in New Mexico. I lived in New Mexico near uh, Alamo Air Force Base a number of years, and the uh, so the uh, places in New Mexico that have been declared in Texas declared contaminated by the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I just wonder what is your great experience, what long time experience, and obviously you probably had discussions, arguments with people about nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. um, how would you answer you know, the, uh, the concerns about it? I was happy not to see it mentioned in the rest of the <laughs> after you mentioned it first. I did a lot of research about the theater dream, and so it can be Kansas radioactivity. And, uh, so I'm interested in what you might have to say about it. And thank you very much. I really found it very encouraging what you presented in your mm -hmm. uh, presentation. Great. Uh, so uh, there, there is a national lab whose focus is nuclear energy. That's the Idaho National Lab, and they are the applied lab uh, like we are for renewables. They are for, for nuclear. Now, we, I sit in the cabinet meetings with uh, Undersecretary Christina Johnson, and we talk about the various pathways. And in fact, we have a, a new report that's coming out that will talk about what each of these technology pathways uh, can provide. Uh, you know, I, I, I still go back to the what attributes do we do we need and, and do we demand of our technologies. Uh, I did have a, the opportunity to spend a year with the uh, University of Chicago and uh, was on the Argonne National Laboratory board for a little bit um, and pursued the Idaho National Lab uh, contract with CH2M Hill. Um, what I can say about nuclear is, is the following. Uh, the, 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 the technology that we have today is not sustainable. It's not sustainable from the fact that we, we bring in uh, enriched uranium, we put it in a light water reactor, we essentially use about 1 to 3 percent of the energy content in a fuel rod, and then we dispose of it. Makes no sense. That's not sustainable from the perspective of you probably don't have enough uranium to keep doing that. And, and, and second of all, you really don't have a place to put the waste. So you got kind of the first big problem is you've got to solve the waste issue. There's one technical solution to solving the waste issue, and that's reprocessing. You take the spent fuel rods, and you take them back, and then you reprocess them. Very complicated process. It causes all kinds of other issues, one of which is it, 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 you go through intermediate steps that essentially creates materials that now can be used for weapons of mass destruction. So now you've got a proliferation issue. How do we keep that from happening is a whole other set of issues and technology challenges. Now, I've been in the Department of Energy for enough time to know that all my colleagues at the other national labs, certainly the nuclear weapons laboratories and the science laboratories, all believe there are technical solutions to both of those issues. That you can do the reprocessing, you can minimize the fuel cycle so that you don't have a lot of waste, and then you, uh, you can render the processes of reprocessing such that they don't become proliferation issues. Those are research projects. Those are research projects that will take many years, perhaps decades, to resolve. Should we be doing that? Absolutely. I do believe that at the end of the day, the attributes of the future energy system need to demand of the technologies that supply that energy, those that, that you're rigorous about safety and supply and affordability and, and, and reliability and accessibility and the, and the carbon footprint, all of those things need to be done on a life cycle basis. If you do that analysis and you do it rigorously, and, and they're able to solve all of those, uh, the, the challenges for getting to those attributes, then they should be part of the mix. Until that time, I don't think they should be part of the mix. So as a technologist, I think you can solve a lot of those problems. It will take time. The same thing with carbon capture and sequestration. There's a lot of issues with, with how you do that. So when I, what I come back to is we've got pathways, whether you're talking about nuclear, fossil fuels, or renewable energy and energy efficiency that require, to require and demand new research. What I can say is, under any scenario, efficiency trumps everything. Do that first. There no, shouldn't be any debate about doing efficiency, and yet we simply can't kind of get off the dime on that. So do efficiency first. The next low-hanging fruit is what I call the no regrets option. Why wouldn't you use as much solar energy and wind energy as you can use? Why wouldn't you? What's the downside of that? There isn't any. So if, if you're talking about getting or in an orderly progression to the end point, then I think there are some obvious things to do. And we just need to come to grips with what are our objectives and how are we going to get there. I am not persuaded by arguments that say, 
let us go one more round on light water reactors and just build a whole bunch of light water reactors and we'll figure it out later. I say no. I say let's, let's figure out what the pathway is to a sustainable energy economy using nuclear and then let's be about building that pathway because nuclear reactors right now, 30 year lifetime. The, the, the program plan in the nuclear programs of the Department of Energy are to extend their lifetimes to 60 years. And after that, we will extend their lifetime to 90 years. If you've got a, a, a capital stock that's going to last for 100 years, why am I going to lock myself into the next 100 years on technology that I know is not sustainable? I think until we have a discussion and a dialogue at the national level about the attributes of these various pathways, I don't think we ever solve the problem. And I think what we need is an educated public, and a rigorous analysis around what does it take to get to the endpoints of an energy economy. So, sorry to get emotional about that, but that, I think that's really where we are. <laughs> All right. Let me see if I understood it correctly. It sounds like you're saying that one of the great problems here that we have is the transmission. If you're losing 62% of the energy to transmission, what kinds of technologies are on the horizon to allow us to transmit uh, electricity over long distances uh, much, much more uh, e efficient as a, as a small time investor. Boy, that really sounds like a winner. <laughs> yeah. Are we talking here about building more power lines? Are we talking about uh, new types of transmission that are just more efficient? Yeah. Uh, let, let me be clear. Uh, the 62% inefficiency is from the energy content in the energy supply. So the first thing you do is you, is you take, let's say you extract coal or natural gas out of the ground and you run it through gas turbines that are 30% efficient. All right. so, that, so you start losing efficiency right at the very beginning. The transmission wires themselves do in fact have a loss. Those losses are on the order of 10%. Uh, so, but, but as they accumulate all the way to the end point to where you actually use the electricity coming off the wall to plug it into your appliance and the appliance provides you the service, the average losses are 65%. Your point is still valid. We do need to be about a new smart transmission grid. But it, but it isn't all attributed to just the wires. Okay. Um, good afternoon, sir. <laughs> Uh, if you said that uh, we are fighting toward 80% of CO2 emissions in um, right. 2050, how do you think the term recycling would affect to fight the, the CO2 emissions and accomplish uh, to be lower the 80%? Uh, let, me, let me understand the question. So the, the recycling of, of the carbon emissions? No. Everything oh. recycling. In just, just, just in general recycling. General. Yeah. Well, what, what, what we've determined is if you start looking at life cycle analysis of, of the use of materials and of, of, the, of the energy usage, what you'll find very quickly is that you really do want to recycle everything you can. Uh, you know, putting things in landfills is not a sustainable energy practice anyway. Uh, and, and that, in fact, as you think about how do you, like the building that we're building, we were very attentive to what are the Car what's the carbon footprint of construction? In other words, are we flying in materials from, you know, from another country to bring them to build that building? There's, a, there's a, essentially a cost associated with that in terms of environmental impact. So we decided that we're going to make, we're going to make this building out of materials that are kind of local. You know, we're, we're using the forest the thinnings. We're using a variety of, of metrics that say, let's think about the entire life cycle of all the raw materials when they come into the building, as well as how we use them and how we generate the energy to actually do the construction. So if you think about the problem holistically, then recycling becomes a very important part. And land use, water use, and a variety of other things that are environmental impacts that we don't normally think about when we're attributing costs to a particular task. And so, uh, you know, that's why we use the word sustainability. Sustainability means it's not just about the cost and the energy, it's about all the other implications that include things like your, you know, the, the so-called triple bottom line, you know, the social impacts, uh, you know, the, the variety of things that really relate to how do you create uh, a, a community where the impacts of the, of the, of the generation and development of energy are, are positives, not negatives. Thanks.